ceremony for us and our land acknowledgement. Honey, Bajou, Tanzi, Sego, welcome everyone. So in keeping with our traditions, I wish to acknowledge that the city of Toronto is located on the traditional territory of many indigenous people who over time have occupied and made this land their home from time immemorial. Today I will share with you a brief timeline and history of the many peoples who have had the privilege of being the keepers and stewards of southern Ontario. There were the ancient ice runners known as the Okuming and Inuit of Anishinaabe Algonquin lineage that predate the current indigenous population by some 130,000 years. We now know that the Wendat Nation, also known as the Huron, first settled in southern Ontario along the Aramosa River, just north of the present city of Toronto, some 9,000 years ago. Also, the ancestors of the present eastern woodland people of Canada were evident locally some 13,500 years ago at the end of the last ice age until those first settlers from Europe arrived 500 years ago. And with them, they unknowingly brought disease that were unfamiliar to this part of the world to the indigenous peoples who lacked immunity that resulted in smallpox epidemics that virtually wiped out the Huron Wendat people. The fur trade influenced wars between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, specifically the Bay of Pointe Mohawks people in the year 1696. The land once occupied by the Wendat, Neutral, and Tobacco or Patoon nations was now again part of the Three Fires Confederacy of the Anishinaabe Nations Territory. The Three Fires Confederacy included 24 nations and the Mississaugas of New Credit who settled in the early 1700s in what is now the present day city of Toronto. The Mississaugas extended hospitality to all who arrived in their territory. The name Toronto originated from the Wendat language which means where the sticks stand in the water or the meeting place and fishing weir. In any case, the territory was a gathering place where trade and social interaction occurred much like what is happening here today. Even while many of the indigenous peoples found this area to be a natural meeting ground, so too did those early settlers who saw the value of the area and the access that it had to the Great Lakes. It wasn't long before the settlers asked the Mississaugas for some land, and there, much deliberation, the elders and leaders considered the request of the newcomers for a parcel of land to create a permanent settlement. The Mississaugas head chief, Wabakanini, along with principal chiefs, agreed to the sale of the tract of land called the Toronto Purchase to the settlers on August 1st, 1805. Although payment for the land wasn't concluded until the year 2010, as a result of the Toronto Treaty, surrendering the protection and management to the present generations of inhabitants of the citizens of Toronto, who now share a covenant with Indigenous people to care for this territory and our responsibility to continue the tradition of compassionate stewardship of the land so that the future generations will continue to enjoy the unblemished beauty of these lands. Remembering always that we never owned the land but rather bore its use from our children. We acknowledge the gift of a portion of the traditional territory of the Mississauga people of New Credit to the citizens of Canada. And also in accordance with their teachings, we acknowledge and honor the many diverse cultures and people who over time have made this territory their home. We begin with a group of travelers who left their moccasin-clad footprints in the blue clay beneath the buildings here in downtown Toronto. The moccasin footprints were uncovered by a dredging crew while doing underwater work at the foot of Bay Street back in 1908. That trek by those first peoples took place over 12,500 years ago. And as we reach back to those first Torontonians, we also remember our Mother Earth through the seven grandfather teachings, wisdom, courage, respect, honesty, truth, humility, and love. And we also honor and acknowledge the four directions, the north, the south, the east, and the west, and we acknowledge and honor the four elements 
water, air, fire, and earth. And we acknowledge and honor the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. These four seasons represent the circle of life. The spring is for the children and observation. The summer is for the adolescence and listening. And fall is for adulthood and sacred fire and remembering. And the winter is the time with the elders, a time for sharing. Nin Dinaway Magani Dak, which means all my relations, which means we are all related. I'm going to light the smudge. And what I'm burning today is sweet grass. I'm going to show you how I smudge. Clear my thoughts, my vision, my voice, my hearing, my body, my legs and feet. And last and most importantly, I clear my heart. And the reason that I clear my heart last is because everything that I do here, I want to think with my heart, not just with my head. Because uh, thinking with your heart is long-term thinking. So I'm going to pass the smudge. And I'm going to ask you guys to try and control this fire as best as you can. Okay? And so if it seems like it's going to go out, go like this, okay? And then smudge, okay? And what does that mean? Reciprocity. That means you have to work in order to get something, okay? okay I'm going to do the song while you guys are smudging. This, this song is, uh, this is a Sundance song because I'm a Sundancer and I'm a pipe carrier and I'm going to share this song with you.
Um, great. Uh, so first thing tonight, we have a hashtag. Hashtag right to walk to. Um, so please use it if you're a Twitter person or a social media person. Um, so next, we would like to just give an enormous thank you to our sponsors for this event. Um, so we have the University of Toronto School of Cities, um, the Urban Studies Program here at um, Innes College, uh, Spacing Magazine, as well as Public, public Space Workshop. Um, if it wasn't for these guys, we would never be able to have an event that's free and as inclusive and accessible as possible. So thank you guys. Thank some of our partners who helped us spread the word, James Walk, um, Toronto Public Health, um, as well as uh, Transportation Equity Toronto. So thank you guys as well. <laughs> Walk Toronto is so excited to be hosting this event with this amazing group of speakers. Um, Walk Toronto is um, a small grassroots, grassroots organization that is fighting to make the pedestrian experience in Toronto um, as enjoyable and inclusive as possible for, for everyone who lives in our great city. Um, much of what we do is focused on policy and design. So some of our recent campaigns included sidewalk clearing in the wintertime, which has been um, a big issue this year. Um, another recent campaign was supporting Reimagine Young Street, which was, go which was a proposal to add bike lanes, wider sidewalk, um, and increase the street livelihood of Young Street up in North York. But with our six year anniversary event, we really wanted to get at the heart of, of why we do this work. So walking is the most intimate way to get to know a city. It's the most affordable way to move around and it's the most accessible way to, walk, to move around the city. Um, Walking is important to our human spirit, and it's the best way to connect with our environment. Um, so we've invited this incredible group of speakers who's going to help us dive deeper into that. Um, they're going to help us understand our love for walking, our need for walking, and they're going to do it through a social justice and equity lens. So with that, I would love to introduce our speakers. Um, so first up, we have Nadia Halim. Please come on up. Um, Nadia is a longtime Toronto walker. She's organized exploration walks across the city and is the host of The Opposite of Lonely, a podcast that discusses how people create community and social connection. So next, you've met him. Thank you so much for the beautiful smudging ceremony. Um, Philip Cote of Moose Deer Point First Nation is a young spiritual elder, indigenous artist, activist, educator, historian, and traditional wisdom keeper. Philip is a tour guide with First Story, providing an indigenous history of Toronto covering the last 13,500 years. And Philip holds an MFA from OCAD. Welcome, Philip. Next, we have Danielle Levy Pinto. Danielle has extensive experience walking for the elimination of, accessible, of accessibility barriers in physical and digital spaces and advocates for pedestrian safety. Daniela is totally blind and relies on her guide dog for mobility. Danielle is a Walk Toronto Steering Committee member and holds a PhD in political science. Welcome, Daniela. And last, we have our moderator, Zara Ibrahim. Zara is a public interest designer using design process to reform community engagement, institutional innovation, and participatory decision making. She has led two of Canada's pioneering design and innovation firms challenging organizations across all sectors to better engage their users. She sits on the board of James Walk, of St. Stephen's Community House, of CP Planning, and the Toronto Biennial. Welcome, Zara. So Zara is our moderator. So can we give all these guys a And actually, before I hand over, I forgot some logistical things. Accessible bathrooms are um, here in the cafeteria, but there are additional bathrooms um, downstairs in the basement. And I think I forgot one more logistical thing, right? Well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks, Lena. Um, and welcome to this fantastic panel. Philip, thank you for that great grounding to start our conversation. 
Um, you definitely accomplished it for me getting out of my head and into my heart. What a beautiful way to end my work day and transition into a dialogue uh, with all of you actually tonight. Um, it's really exciting and thank you. You know, I, I was so thrilled to hear that 260 people RSVP'd to this event. Um, I think the organizers were sort of hoping that just maybe a few less showed up because Innis Town Hall can't put that many people, but um, it's just so great to see this full house here thinking about how we walk the city and how we do it in a fair and just way. And it just, you know, I was talking to Lena before we started the event, and one of the things I was wondering was, when we hear about you know issues in the city around our infrastructure, the cyclists rise up, the drivers rise up, but where are the pedestrians? Regardless of where we fall into this sort of great debate, that's not really a real debate in my opinion, um, all of us, whether we're cycling, whether we're driving, whether we're using alternative forms of mobility, a lot of us at some point will be walking, even if we are driving somewhere. And so I think what's so interesting about the framing of today's panel and what I'm so interested to talk about is that because a lot of us, a good portion of us walk everywhere at some point in our day, if we look across the city and see where that infrastructure is, it sort of shows who and where we value. And that, as someone who works across the region and across the city, I, I notice a lot. I'm like, you know, this isn't a crisis about like whether the sidewalk's nice or not. It's a, it's a crisis of omission. Right? Like where we place sidewalks, where we care for sidewalks, really represents our, our values as a city. And so I, I really do think that um, this is a justice and equity issue. It's not an infrastructure issue. And that's why I'm so excited uh, to talk to these amazing panelists today. Uh, so welcome. So here's the format. Um, we're going to give each panelist a, a, a really fast five minutes to speak. Um, they're going to do a rapid fire introduction to a concept around walking or some of their work around walking uh, and connecting people through walking. I am going to tap three times on the microphone if you have hit five minutes, which means you have two minutes left. And then if you get to seven minutes, I might just come up and ask you to sit down. Um, so you're going to each have five minutes, maximum seven minutes. When you hear the tap, it means wind it down. And then we're going to have about half an hour to have a conversation. And then I believe we have a little bit of time for audience q and If that, that's right, we have a little bit of time at the end for some questions and answers. So I'm really excited to hear our first speaker, speaker Nadia Halim. Welcome. walking so valuable that every, it's something that everyone should have a right to. Uh, Walk Toronto necessarily focuses on policy conversations that tend to have a focus on active transportation, which is like we're transformation is obviously a vitally important uh, focus of policy, but there are so many more reasons to walk and there are so many more kinds of walking that I think are valuable enough that everyone should have access to them. So I'm, uh, some of those things might include uh, walking is a valuable way to learn about your city, to understand its history, to understand what's happening to it right now. Um, it can be valuable as a tool for civic and political engagement. It can be a great way to connect with your friends and meet new people. Uh, and sometimes, on a good day, it can be a way of finding wonder in everyday life. Um, so I'm here just basically as a person who has done a lot of walking in Toronto. Uh, and I'm going to try and give you a lightning round before uh, Zara cuts me off. <laughs> just some of what I've learned walking in different contexts and with different groups of people over the past 15 years. There we go. So, like geography, uh, 2005, this, this is a very 2005 photo to me. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term psychogeography, I won't get too into it because I only have five minutes, but uh, loosely the study of how the geographical environment affects how people feel and behave, um, and it's less a scientific or sociological hard science kind of term, it's more about the philosophical study of those things, uh, an investigation through art practice and, and through walking. The, 
Toronto Psychogeography Society was uh, a loose-knit group of friends that was organized by Sean McAuliffe in the early 2000s, sometime around 2002, 2003, I think is when it started. Um, Dylan Reed of, of Walk Toronto, who is here tonight, is also uh, one of the early walkers. Uh, and I got wind of this um, around 2005 and, and joined, and uh, it really opened up the world to me. What Toronto Psychogeography Society was was simply uh, there was a mailing list. There were a bunch of people on this mailing list. And every Thursday, someone would propose a starting point, usually a subway. They would say, everybody, you need to get Glencairn Station at 7.30. And everyone would turn up there. And then we would just start walking. Uh, we didn't have a destination, destination in mind. There was no program. It was just like, everyone show up once a week somewhere in Toronto, start walking. Um, and this, like I said, really opened up the city to me. I had lived in Toronto at that point already for about 10 years. And I realized that I only, you know, I was used to walking the area around where I worked and you know where I went to school, where I lived, but there were huge swathes of Toronto that I'd just never been to because I had no reason to go there. But with uh, Toronto Psychogeography Society, we walked East York, we walked Mimico, we went into the ravines, we went down to the waterfront, uh, and I just uh, suddenly the city became a much larger and more detailed place to me. I have a few slides I'll just burn through. This was uh, a picture of some birders. Um, sorry, to go back one. That photo uh, shows that it's the uh, young group of young psychogeographers around a fountain, dramatically lit. This one <laughs> is uh, some girders. I believe this is a bridge at night down near where uh, Corktown Common is now. Uh, this is that time some of us decided we were going to try and walk out of the airport and walk into the city. I think <laughs> it's a long walk, I can tell you that. I think we got as far as Etobicoke before we got really tired and got on the bus. But that's uh, some of us on outside what was then the um, shuttered Terminal 2 uh, with some pylons in front of it wandering around. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, that's uh, some of a group of us um, in a ravine at night looking at some graffiti. Uh, oh, the um, Harris filtration plant is just a, a beautiful thing on a summer night with a, the moon on a clear night. Uh, it's a remarkable thing to see. Uh, and that is the view from the um, uh, platform on top of the hill at Evergreen Brickworks. If you climb the hill, there's a group of us looking at the, the Toronto skyline. It's an amazing place to stand and look at that from. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the, the whole idea of people just walking for fun was so interesting and unusual that the Globe and Mail sent John Bentley Mays to walk with us one night <laughs> and figure out what we were doing. It's, it says Globe and Mail, May, May 20th, 2006. The headline is Walk About is Fair Play. Um, because we, you know, sometimes we would tell people that we, I did this thing and they would be like, so is it fundraising? No, no, it's not fundraising. Oh, so, so, so it's an exercise thing. No, it's, it's, it's not power walking. Uh, are, you, are you protesting something? No, no, we're just, we just, we just go for walks. Um, and Bentley Mays, to his credit, uh, really got this. He said someplace, uh, these, these aficionados of the urban sublime uh, are driven principally by a high level of curiosity, which is, which is true. Uh, so that's walking as, as, a, as discovery, walking out of curiosity as a way to understand your city better. Um, so I got so into walking through Toronto Psychodrography that I wound up working for James Walk for uh, a few seasons. Um, this is James Walk. It's uh, May 3 to 5 this year. If you are interested in going on walk or maybe leading a walk, still time, plenty of time. Um, the photo is of uh, one year we had these cards. Um, oh, <laughs> we had these cards printed with a die cut card that you could punch out so you could take a photo through the card of your walk and post it on Instagram. Uh, so Jane's Walks, again, you probably know about them if you're here. It's a really great way of walking a civic engagement, a uh, way of getting involved uh, with your city um, and meeting other people who are interested in the same issues as you. Um, this is Phil Pogan leading a walk that was called uh, Eat Danforth East, which is about the, the many wonderful places to get food in Danforth East. Walking with someone who has an incredible degree of enthusiasm about a place and a lot of knowledge about a place can make you see that place through different eyes. Uh, so again, I've, got, I've, got, I've had the warning, so I'm going to keep going. Um, I still organize, we, the Toronto Psychogeography Society kind of ground to a halt for the usual reasons. People got married and moved away, and I still, but I still organize walks um, through a Facebook group that I have. And I tell people, you know, I can, I can invite you, you can join our Facebook group, but you can also do this yourself. All you need is to like get a bunch of friends together and go for a walk. You don't need any expertise, you don't need any, any special equipment. So just quickly, uh, this is some of us exploring. There's a, a Shoppers Drug Mart, 
in um, Blue Rose Village that used to be a cinema and still they still have the old projector just kind of sitting there on the second floor. <laughs> you can go up and look at it. Um, my friend Melissa decided we did, had to do a brass rubbings walk, so that's all, all of us taking brass rubbings on one of Joe Fafard's car, uh, cow sculptures in, in the uh, financial district. Uh, that's the urban ge geographer, Daniel Rothstein, leading a walk of us, uh, a group of us in the in Yorkville Mall. And um, I don't really have time to talk about this. In my podcast, The Opposite of Lonely, is about uh, social connectedness. As you've probably gathered, I think walking with people is a great way to build social connectedness, get to know people, strengthen your friendships. And again, I, I also come <laughs> back to this. This is Inglewood. The people of Inglewood Drive really, really love their giant 20 foot Santas. So actually, I think they're like 10, 15 foot. They're, they're really huge. It's a street full of giant inflatable Santas on every lawn, as far as the eye can see. This happens every Christmas. It is, it is worth walking over there and taking a look. But uh, just to wrap it up, I think that. Uh, this is an example of the kind of weird and wonderful thing you can see just by going out, going for a walk with nothing, no particular goal or destination in mind, just to see what you can find. So, thank you. Nadia, you just made me um, think about something that I brought up when we first chatted, when we all got together for a conversation, which was, uh, my, one of my favorite James walks of all time, which I think you were on and you know the organizer. Um, but a few years ago, this incredible woman, um, she used to do these night walks for James Walk. And she would take us through uh, somewhere around Babby Point. Like we kind of met at Babby Point and descended into the wild, um, which is just the ravine, but at night it feels like the wild. And we would walk at night and she would talk, uh, she, she would talk about sort of the politics of walking at night. And she would talk about like this sort of reappropriation of nighttime walking. So I was so happy to see so many pictures of evening and nighttime walks because I think that's part of the politics of walking. She spoke extensively about who walks at night and the safety of walking at night and how we've made it unsafe to walk in the evening in our cities and at nighttime in our cities and really trying to um, flip the stigma and flip the fear around walking at night. So I, I'm really glad that you're advocating for that. We'll talk about it more. But for now, I'm going to invite Philip to join us at the lectern. OK, so I've done some research. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's um, it triggers a lot of things when you um, start actually looking through history and try to digest that history into uh, a Western view as opposed to indigenous views. And, uh, but I, I wanna just read some of this and I'll probably break free from what I've written because I think I wanna talk more in terms of how indigenous people see themselves in, in history on the land. And quite often when indigenous people talk about uh, history, especially when they try to describe that history, there are pictographic images, symbols of that history, and this is one of those symbols up on the screen here. This is a birch bark scroll that was done probably about maybe 100 years ago, maybe more. But uh, the, the main thing about this scroll is, uh, I was inspired by the scroll many years ago uh, while doing a mural on New Credit Reserve, and uh, I was really fascinated by the fact that there is a pathway running through that whole history. And it starts at the top on the left, where you see those kind of four figures attached together in the circle. And uh, that pathway describes the history of the Anishinaabe people, which I already mentioned starts around 130,000 years ago. And it's even older than that. So, uh, but we, indigenous people don't have the same kind of uh, uh, way of describing and writing down history as uh, Western people do. But it doesn't matter at this point because I realize that the, you know, just knowing the stories is really important. So um, I'm just gonna read uh, some of the research that I did while trying to describe it from a Western perspective. And I think this is really important because this really kind of shows the difference between the way indigenous people describe their history and the way Western people describe history. 130,000 years ago where I was, is where I will start, probably go back as far as the uh, Pleistocene epoch is typically defined as the time period that began about 6. Point, no, 2.6 million years ago 
and lasted until around 11,700 years ago. The most recent ice age occurred then as glaciers covered huge parts of planet Earth. The Pleistocene Epcot is, is the first in which the Homo sapiens evolved and, and by the end of the Epcot, humans could be found in nearly every part of the planet. The Pleistocene Epoch was the first epoch in the coronary period in which sixth of the Cenozoic area and was followed by a current stage called the Heliocene Epoch. The, main, the remains of glaciers of the Ice Age can still be seen as parts of the world, including the Greenland and Antarctic, but the glaciers did not just sit there. There was a lot of movement over time and there were about 20 cycles when the glaciers would advance and retreat as they thawed and refroze. And science identified the Pleistocene epoch, four key stages or ages, Galassian, Calabrian, Ionian, and Ty Tyrantian. So these four stages is in these times that out of, the, of our story, the arrival of the first man happens and appears in North America during one of these ice ages. So it's at this time that we begin the story of the Anishinaabe people, and they talk about the arrival of that first man and what he does during his time on the land. They describe him walking across the land. And that journey starts on the eastern side of North America. And what that journey tells us, that he describes all these different locations. He describes the Great Lakes. He describes the plains over Saskatchewan and Alberta. He describes the Rocky Mountains. And he talks about all the things that he learns on this journey. And it's really important to think about why we're hearing this description of what he's been doing. And what it really is describing is what the first humans go through during their time here. Because I know that when we think about humanity, we really think about it from a kind of Western view. We don't think about it from an indigenous view. And when you look at this drawing up here, you can see the many stages of this uh, so-called history of the, of the Anishinaabe people. You can see right up there where the top where the two circles are kind of uh, put together, one over top of the other, and you see this kind of like little serpent-like creature kind of rising above the pathway. Well, that symbol above the pathway is the symbol of the, the great flood that occurred here in uh, North America around 9,000 years ago. And uh, there's evidence of this flood uh, through uh, science and uh, archaeology. Uh, it's been discovered about five years ago that they, they saw evidence of this great deluge that happened in North America. And what they're saying that was is the ice age. And they say that the ice actually had kept frozen on the wall, which was part of Toronto. You know, if you look at uh, where Davenport Road sits, the ice wall sat there for about 100,000 years. And uh, the ice wall was quite tall. If you can imagine seven um, CN towers stacked on top of each other, that's how tall this ice wall was. And that ice wall was here, and that is what kind of led us to understand that there was actually a very ancient trail walked upon by the indigenous people here for about 30,000 years to 40,000 years. And uh, the most kind of recent evidence of indigenous people being here in Toronto is marked by a knife that was found in the Credit River. And this, this happened in 2010. The knife was uh, dated back to 13,500 years. And when I did the land acknowledgement, there was a, a story I talked about where the moccasin-clad footprints were left in the clay. Now that's, that's evidence also that people were here walking across the land at that time along with all of the different megafauna that would have been here, like the giant beavers, the mastodons, the saber-toothed cat, the megatheriums, all these animals were part of our history and part of the way the indigenous people described the land and the, play, the way that they had to live. And um, there, was, there was also 
uh, a new discovery that happened probably in the early 1980s where um, evidence of tool makers were found in North America. There was three sites in North America. One was up here in Manitoulin Island. The other site was down in San Diego. And uh, the third site was found at the top of the panhandle of uh, North America. Do you guys know what that means? <laughs> it means the, you know where Florida is? So Florida is the, is the panhandle of North America. That's what they say. Anyways, these are the three sites, and in these three sites, they have uh, found tools. And what's interesting about all the tool sites here is that the tools are pretty much identical. They're all carved out and shaped the same way. And um, when looking for evidence beyond North America, if you go to the Saharan Desert, there was a tool site that was found there too, also around the same age, you know, 130,000 year mark. What I think is really interesting is that those tools look exactly like the tools in North America. So something very interesting is happening in uh, the way humans begin to create tools and, and find ways to survive off the land. And uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the way this, uh, this diagram is shaped up here. You can see that the, there is a, a hook when you look at the pathway up here and uh, I was uh, shared some information by an elder uh, around eight years ago, and his name was um, Leon Secatero. I don't know if you know this person, but he uh, basically came up to the conclusion that what he was looking at here was the history of the Anishinaabe people from the start in, and to the beginning of the time that we're in right now. And uh, what he says to me during this... Uh, one minute left, okay. What he said to me during this, he says that, you know, there's a, a really important reason why there's a hook on this pathway, and it represents something like how indigenous people see themselves and how they understand themselves in this place, and it represented by a scorpion. And he draws a picture of the simple scorpion and shows the way the tails arc, and he says, you know, the scorpion knows that we're traveling through the universe at 17,000 miles an hour, and I'm just listening. And he says uh, that the reason why the scorpion has his tail arced is because he knows who he is. And so when indigenous people follow their culture and they know who they are, they make that same mark with this pictograph that's shaped up there with that, that curve in it. When they understand who they are, they know that they're traveling in this universe just the way the scorpion is, but also that scorpion knows its purpose, and that purpose is to leave a legacy for the future by following its original instructions. And for indigenous people, following the original instructions is to know yourself. Thank you. I just, um, I just, I couldn't help but think about signals in the landscape that let us know we belong. And so we live in, you know, conceivably the most diverse city on the planet with such a rich and long history, and just thinking about how we look to the urban landscape and see parts of our history and ourselves represented or not represented. Um, your beautiful image, this birch bark, uh, birch bark scroll, um, is such a reminder that like these are symbols that we need to see more often that would signal to us what has come before. So I'm really excited to talk more about that. But for now, we're gonna invite our last speaker, Daniela, uh, Daniela to the podium. and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Daniela Levi Pinto. I am totally blind and this is my title, Angelo. <laughs> there we go. Um, I would like to start by sharing with you what walking means to me. It essentially means freedom and independence. I cannot drive and I cannot ride a bike so uh, the only way for me to get around independently is by walking and by transit. I was born and raised in Mexico City. 
uh, maybe some of you may have been there. And it's a great city, very interesting, but also very difficult to get around for everyone, and in particular for a uh, blind uh, woman. So at some point in my life, I really got tired of uh, being driven everywhere by uh, whoever, but not being independent. So um, with my partner, we decided to uh, find uh, somewhere else where I could actually be independent. And um, Toronto was a great option. Um, I got here in 2006 to do my PhD. Um, and it was amazing. I found a paradise in terms of accessibility. Never in my life I had experienced so much sense of freedom and independence. I could just grab my, grab my dog's harness and walk from my apartment to the subway and from the subway to the U of T uh, campus. And uh, it was amazing. I had never experienced something like that. For the first couple of years that I was here, uh, the PhD was very intense, so I didn't have much uh, opportunity to uh, explore beyond my neighborhood and U of T. Um, but then I started exploring more. By 2009, I had a, not a, a new guide dog, and I ventured to more places in the city, and I realized that things were not as rosy <laughs> as I first thought. Um, when I was riding streetcars, I learned that I could not always rely on drivers stopping before the doors as they should. I found myself navigating from the streetcar door to um, the curb with my guide dog around a car. Um, I realized that there were intersections that were quite dangerous, and I was actually advised to avoid them. I realized that, of course, not inter intersect intersections have accessible pedestrian signals, the, the audible signals. Um, then, uh, well, at, this, at the same time, I started reading news articles about uh, more pedestrians being hit and killed and seriously injured. So this definitely got my attention. I got to Canada, to Toronto, to be independent, and what's this about pedestrians? I became very concerned about distracted driving. Uh, this was, of course, after the um, uh, release of the iPhone. And this became a, an important concern for me. So I um, joined Walk Toronto. <laughs> and it was wonderful to uh, find people thinking already about walking as active transportation from different perspectives and for different reasons health, environment, uh, uh, connecting more with the city. Um, and it was also very important for me. I started learning about planning, which is not my background. So Toronto, um, like other North American cities, was built under, uh, was developed in the 20th century on, on this paradigm that prioritizes cars above any other means of transportation. Um, this is the area, era in which um, the shared responsibility paradigm started. By this I mean that all road users are made responsible for their safety. Um, I can think of uh, public service campaigns, public education campaigns, including by Toronto Police, um, urging all road users, and in particular pedestrians, to be alert, be seen, wear reflective clothing. My, my personal favorite is make eye contact with drivers. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't, and some people can't. And this is just another differential behavior that pedestrians are expected uh, to, to obey uh, because the car is the king, and I think this is wrong. This is not equitable. This is not accessible. Um, as Sarah said um, in the introduction, we are all pedestrians at some point during the day. I believe it is important for us to raise our voices. Um, I believe uh, in that we can do better. Um, Vision Zero, which has been in the news, it's an approach to road safety uh, to minimize the consequences of human error. But really the philosophy behind Vision Zero, it's an ethical philosophy. 
no loss of life is acceptable. Human life and health are paramount and they should not be traded off by, uh, against benefits of the road transportation system. So when we, when we talk about balancing priorities, well, life is a priority and especially for uh, vulnerable road users. Um, which essentially are everyone who is not protected uh, inside a car. Streets belong to everyone, again, not only to those who drive. We are seeing um, a climate change related events and a crisis. The individual car is not the answer. We need to plan cities for the future. Um, the population is increasing. This will only increase congestion if things don't change. An equitable city is a walkable city. Walking, when, when walking, when everyone, regardless of age and ability, can walk, I believe that uh, cities will work, and, and in particular Toronto, will, be, will work better for everyone because people will have real choices to get out of their cars, and so congestion and traffic will no longer be uh, the main uh, the main issues here, or of course, pedestrian decks. Thank you. Daniela, I was um, really, I, I appreciate the frame of real choices. Um, I think that is a, a really powerful a really powerful way to talk about walking, and I can put my, I can put my timer away now. Um, you know, I think it's, it's we, we talk about this sort of battle between pedestrians and transit and cyclists and drivers and what we should prioritize, but we are sort of trading off between options that don't really exist, like half options, you know? like. There's bike lanes that stop, and I don't know if anyone else has seen that video. There's a video where they show like just a cyclist trying to like just bike in a straight line. You can't bike in a straight line uh, because it's just so so broken up. And then if you go outside of the city core, it's like the the sidewalks just outside of their you know lack of repair, they do the same thing. And so I, I really appreciate that sort of before we have this conversation, we need to have options for real choices. Um, so first of all, thank you to all three of you uh, for making it under 10 minutes each. Um, I, I got really good by Daniela at tapping on the microphone, so I'm going to put that in my back pocket for my next moderating gig. Um, but I, I just wanted to start off, you all talked about walking can be a form of civic engagement, walking can be political. Um, and on such, in such different ways that we need to think about like just showing up and taking space as an act of being political. We need to show you know, the history of where we're walking as an act of being political and people just being able to get from point A to point B as part of our freedom. Um, I think that's such a beautiful point, Daniela. And, so the, and, and if I'm wrong, correct me and feel free to correct me. I don't feel like walkers shout as loudly as everyone else. I don't feel like we rise up and I'm complicit in this as well. And so, do you, do you believe that's true? Do you think walkers are, are like, and pedestrians are sort of advocating for their space and fighting for their space in the way that other folks and individuals and interest groups are? And if not, why? Like, why don't we talk about the areas in which we walk as, you know, as political as driving has been made in the, in the recent few years? Directed at anyone to start. It's, okay. Um, I think that one of the reasons for that is that, well, uh, maybe people don't think about themselves as pedestrians. Uh, people drive, people, uh, you know, if, if, they are, if, if they are in a parking lot, they, they're, dry, they're walking to their car, not necessarily consider themselves as, as pedestrians. Plus, I think that the culture has taught people that pedestrians are a nuisance, they're an obstacle. Um, again, the, the education campaigns urging pedestrians to, uh, uh, the victim blaming. Every time there's a collision and someone dies, oh, what were they wearing? Were, were they wearing a, a, a dark clothing? So, and this is only uh, something that we see now, but this has been taught to people to really be fair to cars, uh, be differential to them. 
And um, I believe it is, um, it, I agree with you um, in that pedestrians don't shout as loud, some, <laughs> some do. Um, if we think of uh, things we can do, I mean, not me because I don't feel safe doing it, but uh, when cars are invading our little space, our crosswalk, what do people do? Do they rush, uh, even if they have the right of way to not uh, incommodate the driver? Or do they assert their presence, make eye contact, and I have the right of way, and I need to continue? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would just jump in and say, you know, I, it, when you say that, I, I'm, I already feel scared thinking about asserting myself when I'm in, a, in the position of being a pedestrian to a driver. It's, you know, it's scary thinking that they're behind this big machine and I'm just on, on my lights. And so, um, but, but it's a point well taken. Do we accommodate or do we, do we rise up? Yeah, it's true that there is a separation between drivers and pedestrians. And you can really notice it when you come to a, an intersection and you have to cross the lights and you know that drivers are waiting to turn. You feel like you don't have the right to take your time. You always feel like you have to rush across in front of the drivers so that they don't run you over. It's not that bad, but it feels like that at times. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, I think that there's a... There is some truth behind this, and I'm not sure why the phenomena is happening with uh, people not being able to speak up about having the right to walk on the sidewalk or at the intersections, but I think maybe this could be the beginning of something yeah. right here. I think uh, picking up on that, it's, it's, it has to do also with the messaging that we're getting from authority and from the police, for example, have been really cracking down and having these campaigns lately about um, preventing people from starting to walk across the street once the countdown begins. This is a thing. And they've been like, going out and like ticketing people for starting when it's like the hand changes, to the, or the, the, little, the little white man changes to 18. <laughs> so 18 seconds. Which, first of all, I think is kind of a ridiculous rule because it means you basically often have like a three second window to start walking. And if you're not at the intersection at the exact right time, I mean, it's not, it seems like an, unreal, an unrealistic rule and not one that people are going to follow when there isn't a policeman there. <laughs> but also it really is an example of the kind of emphasis that is put on micromanaging pedestrian behavior without, you know, while cars tear through the intersection or stop at the crosswalk or whatever they're doing. <laughs> there just seems to be a lot less cracking down on that. And to the question of um, why, aren't, why aren't pedestrians up in arms, I think I wonder about it has something to do with the idea that, um, if you look at other groups that get up in arms, for example, cyclists, who, you know, you get critical mass, you get a lot of different um, uh, initiatives that cyclists are doing to try and make the city a safer space, it's because people are really passionate about cycling, and it is something that people do in groups, and it's something that people kind of, like, have an identity around. And maybe if we had a little bit more of that around walking, uh, you'd see people sort of getting, getting behind walking safety a little bit more. Just makes me think we have an audience full of people who are interested um, in this topic. I just wanted to s do a quick survey. How many people in this audience have been political? I'm assuming you all like walking, which is why you're here, so I'm not going to ask that question. How many people here have, have been political about walking and being a pedestrian? Put your hand up. So I'd say, I don't know, what, what do we think? That's like 30%. Um, so for those of you who put your hand up, do you mind just saying, like a couple people, just sharing what that looked like? What what that political act looked like? Right. Um, there was construction happening at my intersection, and rather than on the sidewalks, and there was a police officer there directing cars, so there was no space set up for pedestrians to walk, so we were being forced into the road. Um, so I stood there with the police officer and then called my city councilor until they sent an inspector over and then they forced a, a pedestrian walkway. Yeah, that's a serious example. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. Be so hopeful. I'm always hopeful, but that made me even more hopeful about our city. Um, this lady in the back, you put your hand up.
It just makes me think of, thank you for that, and thank you for both of those. I would love to survey everyone, because these are great stories. Um, it makes me think of a piece I heard on CBC about this cyclist in somewhere in the prairies who goes around and hands out pamphlets um, to drivers that bother him. Um, so he bangs on their window angrily, but then hands them a pamphlet uh, and says, let me educate you. So I'm really into that, and it seems like you're doing some of that. You know, some of, some of what I'm hearing in these examples and in your stories is that um, part of being a pedestrian and part of being a safe pedestrian is taking up space. Um, and taking space is a really political act. Um, you know, I remember one of my favorite posters, I was in Washington for the Women's March, and I remember the poster that was my favorite, which said, take up space. Um, and that was the, the sort of politic for women. Um, and so in the spirit of taking up space with more things that we need on the sidewalk and with more things that we need in our sort of pedestrian realm, um, what, what would you wish for? Like, what do we need to make this? And, and I'm, I'm going to probe you to be as specific as possible. Um, you know, let's assume we all want connected infrastructure that flows. But what do we need to take up that space? And maybe that's psychological. Um, so for some of us, we don't feel safe walking because we're women, we're people of color, we're in certain neighborhoods. Um, we lack sort of particular types of accessibility. What do we need to take up space? What, what needs to change in our pedestrian infrastructure for that to actually feel good? What's your wish list? Okay, here we go. What we need, uh, I can talk about what blind people need, is um, straight, clear pedestrian, uh, a, a pedestrian clear way, free of clutter, obstacles. Like, I, there's so many things on the sidewalks, unnecessary. How many ad signs do we have? That's clutter for people trying to use the sidewalks. It makes sidewalks much narrower, hydro poles, newspaper boxes, and I wonder why they are still there, who, you know, who uses them anymore. <laughs> um, name an endless uh, list of obstacles. I don't even know what they are, but I feel them because my dog brings me around them. Um, clear ways, of course, uh, and we need numbers as well. Something important to remember is that, of course, not all uh, streets have sidewalks, but when, uh, when the city tries to uh, build a sidewalk when roads are being reconstructed, the locals complain because the sidewalks may change the, the character of the, of the street, the feel of the street, and so uh, these issues become political without need for them to, uh, to become political. It's, um, and it's also the, the money allocated for this infrastructure. There's no, I mean, there's, there's limits to uh, improvements for pedestrians, and everything, well, most of, uh, of the budget is uh, spent on uh, driving infrastructure. So numbers, numbers so that we're visible and uh, politicians know that uh, we may not be elected. Well, well, uh, my take on this whole situation is um, numbers, but not in terms of funding. Numbers in terms of people joining groups that take over the sidewalks, that uh, make uh, that walk down the sidewalk uh, a point. And the point for me would be uh, that I do tours, and sometimes I do tours at night, and we're walking tours where we walk across Nice distances, you know, like five to ten kilometers, something doable for anybody. You don't have to be like an athlete to do that kind of walking, but something where people can find some unity and something in common that they're interested in doing and bring in a group, gather the group together and have them meet at a certain place and have the route 
planned out and find out together what happens. And sometimes we do run into, you know, drivers that uh, don't seem to know the rules of the road. And, and so, you know, sometimes you have to stop those drivers and tell them what the rules of the road are because you know. So it's about being active, an active participant in the act of walking. So know the rules so you can share the rules in case you need to do that. It's not an excuse to, um, you know, put the drivers down because, you know, there's a lot of wars going on on the streets between the drivers and the cyclists and now it's the pedestrians at the walking intersections because of a new rule. Like you say, like when I first heard that, I couldn't believe it, that they had, you know, as soon as that sign's flashing, you shouldn't be walking on the road, but so many people don't listen to them. So there's a give and take out there, and I think it's just to be prepared to know the rules so that you can take advantage of those and share that wisdom with other people. Well, look, the first thing I thought of was uh, actually what Daniela said, which is that there's there's a lot of stuff on the road that shouldn't be there, like <laughs> advertising things, uh, you know, boards, sandwich boards or whatever they are, the, the things blocking blocking your way you, when you walk. And I also find it very frustrating that there often seems to be uh, construction that is set up in such a way that the sidewalk completely disappears. And either there's a sign just saying, you know, pedestrians use other side, or there's just nothing. There's, you, you kind of get to the construction zone and there's no way out, and there's a kind of like terrifying dash alongside traffic to get around the thing. And to me that just signals, like, pedestrians are not a priority here. Like, we just don't care. <laughs> we're we're going to build this thing, we're going to put this uh, hoarding up or fencing up. And, um, you know, so what if you have to cross the street or, you know, completely change your route to walk around it? And yeah, so I think uh, prioritizing pedestrians to the point where they actually think it's it's a part of planning a uh, construction project is where are we going to route people on the street rather than, eh. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think the idea of a, you know, I, I go back to Daniela's comment, just making life a priority, I think is, um, you know, we can, we can only have one first priority, and I think that's what it most certainly should be, and then and then helping people to thrive in that life, which I think is um, would be the aspiration around our, our public realm. Um, I have a question that I want to start with Philip on, and then and then extend down to the group. Um, you know, we we've, we've talked a lot about and you know in urban design how to create space for diverse people. So diverse diversity being so broadly defined that lets them know they belong. And you know, to your point, Nadia, like a lot of that is, you know, not visual, it's 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 about just, you know, these unconscious things that we see that they don't go here. Um, and so what I'm wondering is how could we think about our pedestrian realm in a way that really reconciles the history that's underneath the the areas that we walk. Like what would be the sort of aspiration in our in our sort of sidewalks and our public realm um, how would it? How would you let, as an artist, how would you love to see some of that history and storytelling, you know, brought to the surface? Like, what would those signals of belonging look like uh, from a reconciliation perspective? Well, there's a great project happening now. It's been happening for a few years, and it's called the Moccasin Identifier Project. I don't know if you've heard of that, but uh, it's been. Uh, I guess the spear. The spearhead was uh, Carolyn King, who was the former chief of the Mississaugas. She brought the, this to the attention of people in Toronto here, the city council, that indigenous people were being marginalized still in the cities, um, mainly because of uh, certain street names um, were not properly identified. And certainly some names were derogatory and they're still using those words today like Huron Street is a derogatory word which means the, the hairs on a boar's back or a redneck and it means basically that you're ignorant and that's one name that kind of goes down through history through the colonial archives and the other thing too is that um, this Moxon identifier project was put in place to acknowledge historic landmarks that happened in the city of Toronto and in many cases it's where construction is happening and buildings are unearthing artifacts in the ground and they're not talking about it they're not sharing this news that there was artifacts found in certain points in Toronto but uh, you know the first time that they kind of really defended that uh, process was 
uh, a place called Tabor Hill. And Tabor Hill was a burial mound, a Wendat burial mound. And in that uh, place, they were kind of just uh, building the suburbs back in the 50s, around 1954, I believe, they uncovered this uh, burial mound. And uh, what was used to protect the burial mound was the funeral act because they protected the bodies that were buried in the ground. And that's how the first time Toronto began to take notice that indigenous artifacts were actually being protected by part of the system. And not the right part of the system, but at least somebody stood up and used that as a tool to kind of protect the history of the land. And uh, so there was, in that uh, one place, there was 470 access to funding and, and have elders and artists brought into your classroom you had to take a decolonization course so you wouldn't recolonize the indigenous people you're inviting to your class. And that was really important because, you know, probably the whole Toronto really needs to take that course. And it was really great. <laughs> but uh, I work with grade nine students uh, and I've done probably about maybe at least 10 to 15 murals across high schools in Toronto. But I do a lot of work outdoors too. There's a mural at Spadina and DuPont on the north east side of the corner and there's a mural down in the Humber River. There's six, ten murals all together down there and it describes the history of the land through the Anishinaabe storytelling. And then there's a mural at uh, Massey College, kind of just down the road from here. And there's also a mural now at uh, Jarvis and Dundas. And so in these murals, some of them I, I use like a neoclassical style of painting and some of them I use the woodland style of painting. And in every case, I leave a story so that people know what they're looking at. And that's the way I kind of spread the news of Indigenous history across the streets of Toronto. And uh, the NAP10 programming is, is really important because what I'm doing there is I'm planting seeds in some of the young minds of the students there and hopefully they'll help make changes in the future for Indigenous people. Great work. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my watch. I think I have time for one, maybe two questions. And I'm, and, you know, my mind went to uh, a friend and colleague and mentor, Gil Penalosa, um, who some of you may or may not know. He runs an organization called 880 Cities, and he's done some really transformative things all over the world in over 400 cities. And just last week, he, he shared this principle that has, been, that has stuck with me. Um, which is the way to really galvanize people around an issue is to make it the envy of the world. And so to make something that the whole world envies. So if you're trying to get you know, people galvanized around transit, build something in Toronto that's like this transit innovation that the whole world comes to see. So envy is his design principle. And he spends a lot of time yelling at cities and mayors and city councils about whether or not they're building things that sort of um, elicit envy from the world. So I, I would love to hear from each of you, um, when you think about fair and just and equitable cities where people can walk safely and joyfully, Nadia, to your point, like I, I think we, we get so serious about these issues and like joy is such an important part of this. We wanna, we wanna love our freedom and love our history and love our community that we go walking with. Um, so when you think about you know, something you've seen or heard about or even dreamt about, um, that is, that would sort of, that you think would be, that is the envy of the pedestrian world. What comes to mind? Like, what is something that you've seen or experienced, even in a small part of Toronto, that you think is sort of a signal of what, uh, like, if it existed at scale or if it existed in our city, would sort of elicit the envy of, of, of the world enough to sort of organize people around it? Is there anything that you look at and are really excited about? I, I think that uh, it has to be made still. Mm -hmm. For me, I think uh, there needs to be pathways that are designed through the whole city. Uh, and I think there are some really, really special places right in Toronto right now. They're right up in the, um, it's north on Young Street. There's a, a, a train, a train track that was designed for people to walk on and cycle on. What's the name of it? No, yeah, so that's a great thing, and I think it didn't start here in Toronto. I think it started in Chicago, but the idea came from down there because they were already taking care of their old railway lines and using it for other things, and 
having people access that so it was a safe place. It was only a place for people to walk or cycle. And uh, I think that it is happening in Toronto because they have the, uh, the Pan Am path that's part of this whole uh, trip through the whole city. And uh, one of my murals was kind of based on that Pan Am path. And that was the one at uh, King's Mill Park. There's uh, right there at the, the big uh, concrete pylons that hold up the, the TTC, the trains, is where the murals are. So if you want to go and take a look at some history, there's a good place. And, uh, you know, that's the first time that uh, we've done uh, an autocast recording so that you can punch in that um, app, it says autocast, and you can hear the whole story of that mural down there. There's two hours of me talking about what's on the murals. And, but I, I do think that that's a great idea, is creating pathways for people to walk where it is for people, you know, because I think parks are for people and, uh, you know, not all parks have uh, just pathways, you know, like High Park has a road going through it and everything. So there is a kind of balance between people walking and cycling and, uh, and driving cars. But uh, it's not a bad place there, but uh, I think there has been a few incidents over the years about people driving too fast in that park because people don't know how to slow down. So, um, I cannot think about one single place. I can think of elements that I would like to see. Uh, I think of, um, and I am blanking about how to say it in English, uh, tur touristic corridors. So, like essentially streets uh, in tourist towns or cities that are close to. Uh, that are only open for pedestrians. I would love that Toronto would have more of those, or like some of those beyond uh, Sundays in Kensington Market or open streets. Open streets is a wonderful experience um, because people can really walk wherever. Um, so really having separate uh, streets or, uh, that accommodate different users, I think would be uh, something interesting. Um, in particular, I, I like some things that Toronto uh, does. Um, the tactile bumps at corners really help uh, people who are blind to know that you're about to leave the, uh, the sidewalk until snow comes, but that's another issue. Uh, <laughs> another important thing, um, a city like Toronto should be free, uh, should, should have infrastructure to allow, that allows people to walk in the winter, so th this means clearing snow. Um, so uh, I know that uh, Norway and Sweden, either of those, uh, they hit sidewalks so that ice does not accumulate, so really emphasizing more, respecting more pedestrians and offering more infrastructure uh, for pedestrians. Awesome. Nadia? Well, uh, even though I don't work there anymore, I'm going to have to say Jane's Walk for Toronto as a uh, thing <laughs> that, you know, doesn't necessarily uh, spark envy, but uh, sparks, it, it has been embraced widely outside of, of the city of Toronto. So, I mean, Jane's Walk started in Toronto in 2007. It was founded by, a lot of you probably know this, but just to review, uh, some friends of, of Jane Jacobs, the, the, the writer and urbanist, after she passed away, they were thinking, like, how should we commemorate her life? Um, a, a monument in a park doesn't seem like her style. Why don't we start um, a, a, a festival of walks where people can get together with their neighbors and walk around their neighborhoods and try and understand them better? Uh, and when I worked there, um, my job was to coordinate uh, Jane's Walks happening in other cities around the world of which there are now, I think, more than 200 cities participating internationally. And the thing that I always said when, when I worked there was that um, people in Toronto don't realize that Jane's Walks happen outside of Toronto, and people in the rest of the world don't realize that Jane's Walks started in Toronto. They just think it's an international thing, because they're extremely popular around the world. Uh, and I feel like that's something that, uh, but that is something that started in Toronto, and it is something that I think really, you know, uh, had its genesis in, um, some of the things that do make Toronto a really good place to walk and that, you know, that the, the sense of community that we do have. And so I would love to see, um, you know, the, us embrace that and maybe a little bit more municipal support <laughs> for the, the festival itself here in Toronto. Uh, and really kind of uh, 
embrace, embrace that a little bit more as part of our, our civic and cultural identity here. Uh, and maybe that would help support the idea of walking in the city a little more. You just um, make me think that part of the ethos of Jane's Walk is um, the walking conversation, mm -hmm. but the idea that you can nearly resolve any issue by just going on a walk with someone mm -hmm. uh, and talking it out as you walk um, and getting more into your heart, to, to Philip's earlier point. Um, I, I am conscious that we're getting close to our time, and I do want to make sure that the audience has time for questions. Um, I just, you know, I, I really am... Um, interested in just one more, hearing one more thing, and then we're going to put it out to you. So just start thinking about your questions. Are we all going to have a roving mic? Yeah? Okay, great. Oh, they're already out there. Um, so maybe this is the last question I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to toss it over to you. But, you know, something that I'm, I'm really interested in understanding is why we design our cities to only be walkable for such a short amount of the year. Like, we are winter cities. We are rainy, wind, like we got snow, we got rain, we got everything. We got a little bit of sun, we got a little bit of dry weather. But especially now with, you know, our climate changing, we're seeing all sorts of sort of variable days. And so I guess my, my question to you is, are there things that you've thought about or experienced in your walking life that have made the city 24-7, 365. Like, are there little design elements? Because to me, that's such a core element of fairness and justice. Because if you rely on walking as your way of getting around and being free and getting to you know, your employment or school or whatever it is, then we need to think about a year-round city where you can walk all the time. So are there elements that you've experienced that enable that sort of year-round, all-season city that you think are just good to plant in our heads as we're doing all of our, we're going to take this 30% to 100%, all of our walking advocacy uh, in the next you know, few months and years? Are there things that you've seen that would help promote that kind of city? Um, not a solution, but a problem. <laughs> Uh, to me, uh, the, 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 the biggest barrier to walking in the winter, and I really noticed it this year, is not the, the cold so much, because I feel like I can layer up, but um, the ice, and I think that's a barrier for a lot of people, and it, was, it just seemed really bad this year, because we had a lot of, like, snow, thaw, oh wait, freezing, snow, <laughs> it was just, there were, like, these layers of super slick ice, and uh, so far, the, the technology that people mainly use to deal with that is to, like, pour salt all over everything, which of course then just poisons the ground, and there are places in the city where you can see like during the summer yellow grass and dying trees because they've been poisoned by road salt. So someone, I would love to, if someone came up with a, a non-environmentally harmful technology that was really effective at rendering icy sidewalks walkable in the winter, I think that would help a lot. Okay, the answer is Canadian Tire. <laughs> <laughs> they have these great rubber treads that you can buy they fit over your shoes or your boots and they have spikes in the bottom. So no matter how icy it is, you stick, you, you don't slide. And they're great. Yeah, those are good. It's true. Yeah, yeah they're, they are a really great innovation. And, <laughs> and I guess as far as uh, kind of walking around the city, you know, I don't really like walking on the sidewalks too much because I think it's pretty boring. But uh, I like having a, you know, a challenge. So I like going into parks and things so you can go up and down hills and you know you get challenged when you're walking in there and the other great thing about parks is that they have a great tree line and that tree line slows the wind down so even on windy days or rainy days you can get a little cover you know just by nature so walking in nature for me is the best thing uh, because um, it's part of uh, you know that blood memory you know the idea where my ancestors used to do this, and so now I'm doing this, and you know, I pick up on these kind of key kind of signals or memories sometimes when I'm walking through that forest, especially in Hyde Park. You know, Hyde Park is a great place, and sometimes the houses even disappear, and you can imagine that you're not Toronto anymore. <laughs> I don't have any really <laughs> any <laughs> solutions. I would love to find the answer. Um, I spoke about uh, either uh, Sweden or Norway uh, hitting the sidewalks. The great thing about that is that they do it um, somehow, and I don't know exactly how, but using garbage. So they, uh, out of garbage, they process it somehow, and the energy that it generates, they use to hit the sidewalks. 
So something to provide us that, um, of course, without harming the environment. That's really cool. Yeah, that's super cool. That was that's amazing. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. What a great transition. Uh, so out to all of you. We have lots of questions. We have a roving mic, so if you can just make your way to the closest person, and we'll get we'll get to you. There's there's more questions over here as well. We have a mic over here as well. Okay, great. So we'll start. We'll go back and forth. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you, Nadia, for reminding us that walking is fun and you don't have to be going somewhere to walk. I do that a lot, and I, now I feel less weird about it. I just want to say that, uh, you know, in terms of what can we do to uh, take up more space, there's 5,000 kilometers of centerline kilometers of roads in Toronto. So that's, even if you include the pathways that don't include cars, it's still around 5,000 kilometers. There's 7,000 kilometers of sidewalks, which for a second sounds, oh, we have more sidewalks than roads. No, we don't. When you factor in the lanes on the roads, you're up to 15,000 kilometers of lanes for only for cars. Their lanes are wider than everyone else's lanes. And so this is the paradigm. We want to shrink the number of kilometers of lanes for cars in order to increase the space for everyone else. That's the only solution. We don't have more space to, to, to have streets. Uh, the, you know, we have to have the buildings and the parks and the green spaces. There's only so many streets, three kilometers, we have to shrink the number of kilometers for cars. That's not going to slow down the cars. Even if it slows them down, they already travel more than seven times faster than us. So, you know, to me, that sounds fair, and that's the, the type of thing that we should be talking about. On April 4, staff will be re city staff will be reporting back to council on their first draft of the new transportation planning for the official plan. You can go on April 4 to City Hall and make a deputation, or you can write one and send it to the Housing and Planning Committee. So awesome. we'll mark that. Thank you for that. What a great, what a great comment. Um, I, I forgot to share my one rule of questions. <laughs> Uh, I do have a rule, um, and um, it comes from a guy named Misha Gluberman, because I have to cite him, because he's, he's great at coming up with rules for large groups, and this is it. There's no such thing as a two-part question. So if you think you have a two-part question, you have two questions. So just reflect and choose the better of the two. Uh, I just say that only because we want to get to as many people as possible. So we're going to go over here to uh, someone with right here. I, I just want to say thank you to the organizers, especially for providing child minding. I have two kids over there and taking full oh. advantage of it, and it feels great. Amazing. Um, so one thing I do want to point out, and, and it goes along with that last comment over there, is that um, everybody here today talked about the um, what's the word, uh, the social aspect of walking, and I am now a stroller mom, and there is no social aspect of walking, because I literally cannot walk to a rest with another mom pushing a stroller. And maybe that's something that we can actually, that's easy to advocate for and go after, is have wider sidewalks, wide enough for two moms to go stroller to stroller, because it is the young moms right now that have to get their kids to daycare, to school, to the doctors, and if we can't even do that, what is the point of the city? You know, if you can't even raise your kids and get them to the doctor's office, what is the city for? It, it should, like, a dude in a car has 12 feet of space. <laughs> and I cannot walk two abreast on the sidewalk. So I think that's something that is very tangible um, to go after, really. And, you know, when we make those city plans, just to say the sidewalk needs to be wide enough for two people to go across. Uh, we're going to go this way. Um, your wonderful comment made me think about a comment I heard here. Uh, we're going to go right up here to the front. Uh, a comment I heard here by a woman named Cheryl Case, um, who's an amazing urban planner focused on equity. And she talked about how um, what policy discrimination is. She asked a question, um, who here can't afford, their, who can't afford to live? And a whole bunch of people put their hand up. And then she asked, um, who feels like someone is fighting for that? And everyone put their hands down. And she said, that's policy discrimination. If you feel like you're not being thought about, and, and to the point of, of you know, moms, I think that that's something to sort of rise up around. Uh, just, and, she, and I've never heard anyone frame it that way. And to me, it just made so much sense. We're going to go, go up here. Oh, OK. Um, a pedestrian can do everything 
that they're supposed to do. And what can we do when a driver invades the pedestrian space? Um, that happened to my daughter. Uh, she was walking and obeying all the rules. She was on the sidewalk and a driver lost control of her car, came up on the sidewalk and hit her so hard that she basically, well, she died probably within five minutes. And what can we do about that? <laughs> and it's, it may, it's, a, it's a careless driving charge, <laughs> which with a nothing penalty. Then. What can we do about that? I mean, I mean, groups are working to get better penalties, but let's not have it happen in the first place. While our panelists are reflecting, I just want to say I'm really sorry that that happened. That is terrible and should not happen in our city. So I'm, I'm embarrassed on behalf of our city that that happened to your daughter. Well, and I also think that uh, there are laws that need to be changed in order to, you know, uh, bring justice to incidences that happen like that to people who are uh, not doing anything but being uh, a citizen in the city of Toronto or walking down the street. And uh, maybe that's something that uh, can be looked at as far as getting uh, a group together to advocate for... Okay, good. I'm sorry to hear about your daughter. Um. I think that uh, that speaks to our, as a society, as an acceptance of a cost-benefit, um, almost, framework, that people will die uh, as a result of bad design, or uh, the law will say, oh, there, there was uh, a lapse in judgment, it's a second, and it can change a life forever. And we cannot continue accepting that uh, overall as a society. Uh, people are outraged about what has been happening with uh, Boeing planes. And if we uh, count the number of people killed uh, in, in collisions with cars, uh, it's much, much higher. So as a society, we, we cannot continue accepting that. And uh, it's horrible to know that people will likely continue lying until the laws change. Uh, if it was for me, I think that drivers who kill someone should lose their license forever. Regardless whose fault it was, regardless what happens, driving is not a right, it is a privilege, and people should earn it. And, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to echo everything that's been said already. I'm, I'm very sorry that that happened. And um, it's it happens far too often in the city, I think. And yeah, it's when you're driving a car and you make a mistake, you're not the person who suffers most of the time. If there's anyone outside the car in immediate proximity, they're the people who suffer for your mistake. And I think that both the, um, the system of penalties, but also the infrastructure need to reflect that a lot better. I, I want to share a, a, a tip around getting organized around this um, that I had that came out of that same conversation with Gil Penelos. I hope it's not a good conversation. Um, and he shared this sort of little tip for people who are trying to think about pushing these really sticky and really complex urban issues, which was when some of these really progressive policies get passed, if you look a little bit more closely, they get passed without a budget. And so he, he, was, he was speaking to my class at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and he was saying, just next time you feel relieved that a policy got passed around something you care about, like Vision Zero, check to see if there's a budget line. If there isn't, find your way to City Hall. <laughs> and you know, so I can't claim that idea to be my own, it's his, but it, it most certainly has been sitting with me around, I have been auditing every progressive policy that I've been supporting and have seen it sort of go through City Hall and go, all right, we're good. It's someone's doing something about it. The Vision Zero was one of those policies that doesn't have a budget line attached to it or a significant budget line that we need. And so that, if you're looking for something to do, that's something to do. Um, 
because I think I think you're right, and I think this goes back to the first thing we heard from Daniela, which is life should be a priority, and if it's vision zero, it's not okay for 10 people to die. It should be zero people, um, always. So um, just something to be thinking about as we hear stories, to your point, all too often um, about pedestrians being victims in this regard. So questions over here. I just have a quick question about how walking and race happen to collide, um, especially along the Pan Am path. The idea was that it would be open to everyone, but um, I did a lot of hikes. And when you're out in those natural spaces, you won't see a lot of black people there. And part of the rationale is that if you're black people hanging out on the path, you're not supposed to be there, you're out of space, you're out of place. And the assumption is it's up to the good, they will call the police. And I think that sometimes when we design walking or we don't take race into consideration, and walking has a very different meaning if you're black than perhaps if you're white. Well, it happens to Indians too, all the time. When I was down there doing the murals, I was uh, stopped by the police a couple of times and uh, basically told that uh, what was I doing here and uh, to the point that I was uh, accused of uh, being somewhere that I didn't belong and uh, I, I had to make a complaint to the uh, city of Toronto about what the police officer was doing because he was harassing me and basically uh, connecting my nationality with the murder that happened in that park like uh, 30 years ago. And uh, so when he said this to me, I couldn't believe that I was hearing this, but you know, that kind of uh, small thinking still exists in our city. And all I can say is that every time that something like that should happen, you should always stand up and fight for yourself. And if you can't find a way to do that uh, in a good way for yourself, get some help. So I got a hold of some people from the city of Toronto who gave me assistance in how I should deal with the application and complaint to the, uh, the police uh, in the city of Toronto. And uh, I ended up having a meeting with the officer accused of uh, you know, harassing me in the park. But you know, um, it's not just the parks. You know, when I when I was a child, when I was a young man walking in Toronto, I was stopped by the police almost at least once a week. So racism is a really big part of Canada, even though many people don't think it is. It is a big part, and I've experienced it many times. My father, my uncles, all experienced racism in Canada, and the only thing I can say that is that what needs to change is the stereotypical uh, history and attitude uh, portrayed in the, the history books in Canada because you know part of my uh, thesis for uh, university was to uh, uncover a history that uh, repeated this racist notion throughout and all the professors and all the experts they go over these same colonial archives and they repeat that same ideology about who indigenous people are. So the only way to really change things is that for yourself, if uh, get a community organized and start uh, uh, drafting uh, programs that break down this racist attitude and bring this to the, uh, the city council and get them to do something about the police departments who continue to harass young uh, people of color. Thanks for your question, That I, I think that it's this, like, right now it seems like we're hugging a cloud, you know, we're talking about it, but we're not actually grasping onto anything about race and walking in the city at, at our municipal level. And I think it's such a huge part of what makes people feel um, like they don't belong. And, you know, I I, I want to just quickly just the infrastructure. I was yeah, touching exactly. that we had, like, you know, how many thousand? 
7,000 kilometers. I, I would suspect a lot of that is concentrated in our core. Um, and so, you know, I think the sense of belonging is when we have infrastructure that we can appropriate ourselves. So it looks like us, it feels like us, it's like it, it is of us, not just, you know, in the downtown core um, with all these sort of downtown signals, urban design signals as well. So I think that's also part of it, is having places all over the city that we can appropriate and take for ourselves and for our communities, as well as having blended spaces where we can share and create community. And I just think our pedestrian infrastructure is so limited to the downtown right now. Uh, that that's also a huge part of the problem, is that we don't have more places to walk um, as, as a huge challenge. I just want to add something to what I was saying. You know, this, this issue is about representation. And representation is not in the government, it's not in the law, it's not in the delivery of history in the school system right across the country. And I think that please is an important place great to reflection. And thank you to all of you for caring about walking. Um, and please continue to support Walk Toronto and all of their great activities. I'm sure you'll hear more about it. And I'll pass it back to Joker. Uh, I'm just going to announce.